Now, Aiden, let's jump right into it. Um, you were employee number 36 at Google? One of the earliest, yes. All right. Um, when you left, there were 3,000 people there. That was quite a ride. You left in uh, 2000 and, uh, 2005. Tell me, coming out of Google, what did you learn? Well, it was a very interesting experience. Um, very interesting experience because you know, the beginning of Google was also kind of similar to what you were describing with Steffi and DLD, where um, Larry and Sergey were PhD students, and they kind of came up with this idea of applying graph theory to search. And there were a lot of great search companies, and not many people appreciated having a search engine that really worked uh, with no options, no features. So just literally, you hit the button, it works. Um, for me, there were two big t takeaways. One was how both Larry and Sergey, despite never having worked at a company before in their lives, had a great sense of what made a product really, really awesome, and also had an innate understanding, a commercial sense of how something can, can scale. Um, and the way they approached to any problem was coming up with such a crazy goal where an incremental approach would not work. For instance, like my first responsibility was to launch Google in 11 languages. We did it in six months. Next day, Larry came and said, well, that wasn't too bad. Now we want you to do 100 languages in a month. Um, so their approach was always pushing people way beyond their boundaries so that they would be almost forced to uh, think of a very un unconventional way to solve it. The second thing that was very interesting is they brought in a lot of people that were very smart that didn't necessarily have a prior background in a field and gave them a very big problem and said, you're very smart, you can figure out how to solve it. So I think Google was one of the first companies where a lot of people without prior domain experience tackled huge problems, and they also created this very diverse group. Even in the first 100 people that we had, I think there were probably 20, 30 different backgrounds, country backgrounds represented. So this kind of idea of diversity at the core of a company, I also got first exposed at Google. And I definitely want to come back to the issue of diversity, because I think it is one of the cornerstones of your, of your successful investing. Just to finish up on Google, do you think my mic doesn't work? All right, maybe it, that's better? All right, very good. Um, are Google employees today and in the, in the past, are they good investors or are they good employees of Google? I think Google is very good at picking people um, that were very smart, that were very driven uh, to take, tackle a specific problem. Uh, I think it's hard to generalize because I just basically came out with this idea of what makes a product really great, and I had an unconventional approach to investing, and it happened to work. We also have people like Chris Saka that is ex-Google that I think has done extremely well. Um, I think coming back to your point, though, one of the biggest things that happened at Google is that people felt like owners, especially the early people. So even when I left it, when it was 3,000 people, because of stock options and everything, people did not think like an employee. They felt like an owner, uh, a part owner. It was Larry and Sergey's journey, but it was still a shared journey. And it was a really amazing experience to be part of that journey. And so everybody kind of thought from that perspective. And I think that was partially how they were able to deal with really, really big problems, tackle these really huge things, and come up with very unusual ways to solve them. So this is now 2006, bright October day, Californian day. You walk out of Google and you do something else. You decide to start investing. And you do that with, what is it, $4.5 million, which in the world of venture capital isn't the whole lot. Um, so you basically get started. If I now look back over the last 10 years, some facts. You've invested in roughly 180 companies. You've done over 60 notable exits, 11 are valued at more than a billion dollars. You've done three IPOs, companies that you've invested in and that you spotted very early include Shopify, Fitbit, Twitch, Rightroll, Dropcam, and the list goes on and, and, and goes on. You've done over $60 billion in exits. And for the venture investors among you, this guy has returned cash on cash eight times in the course of four funds. Now, let's lift the kimono a bit and see how that came about. When you started investing, what was your investment philosophy? What drove you? Well, when I started, actually, um, it was interesting. I didn't necessarily think about like starting an entrepreneurial journey, 
it started with me thinking, well, maybe I'll delay it a little bit and go to a traditional venture firm and learn the ropes a little bit uh, for a few years. And what was very interesting is the reaction I got uh, because of the typical, uh, atypical background I had and uh, without prior experience, they thought I wouldn't necessarily fit uh, the criteria of what makes a great VC. And that probably is one of the best things that happened to me because it, uh, it forced me uh, if I was really serious about this, to get in, to get all in, and to really be very serious about it, and to do it in a way that is a little bit different than how they practiced it. Um, so the Sand Hill Road wisdom of the time, what makes a great VC? I think they were just, uh, it, I mean, look, I'm sure there are great reasons. There are a lot of very successful VCs. I think the conventional wisdom is you need to be a CEO of the company or very senior at a company that has made it, um, a pr prior investing experience. Uh, I don't know. I think everybody has a different picture of what that is. I just did not fit that bill. But the interesting thing is I didn't fit that bill in anything I did in my life anyway. I was always like, this is what I want. People are like, you have no prior background. I'm like, you just got to let me try it. And I pushed my way and, you know, it, it definitely helped to get to where I am today. And the first four and a half million, that was largely what you basically took away from Google. You then started raising, raising funds externally. And you have some pretty, you know, you're not the the typical VC, and right. you, did some, uh, you did some things that uh, to any LP out there would be pretty scary. You'd say sentences like, valuations don't matter. Really? Well, uh, I think valuations uh, is one of the things that I would say are the things that don't matter the most. Um, so in the beginning, one of the things that happened is after talking to all these VCs that basically thought I didn't have the background and I was starting out, it became clear to me that you know, if you're the hundredth first person trying to do venture capital in a way that the previous hundred people are doing it, it's going to be a very difficult way to succeed. So the first thing I did is I took that four and a half million and for first four years kind of tested my hypothesis. So I, I just started all in uh, and within the first four years we got 12 exits and the idea was... Hang on, 12 exits 12 in, exits four, in years four years while investing? Correct. So your average holding period was? It was very, I mean, those were not huge exits, but I mean, some of them were in the nine digit territory already. And we had exits literally every year, except the first year I've been doing this. So had you specifically been looking at companies that you could sort of flip quickly? No. No, that was not the goal. The goal was uh, essentially um, a couple different things came together. One was this concept that I call prepared mind. So I think the best way to find companies that are going to succeed is not look at what's necessarily hot or big today, but think into the future and figure out uh, what's going to become prevalent, what's going to be interesting. For instance, when I just started, uh, YouTube was just financed by Sequin. I thought, oh my god, I just missed out on one of the greatest companies that's going to get created. And I'm like, well, you know, the natural uh, conclusion was uh, invest in video monetization. So video is already big. A video platform just got back. Video monetization is next. And I backed three companies, and all of which became an exit around half a billion. And so I just took the same strategy and thought about the area Areas that were going to get important uh, and, and had some great luck and timing uh, that gave us uh, great uh, impetus. The other thing was, um, at the time, uh, again, people were not thinking about investing beyond Silicon Valley. They were not thinking about investing across stages. I think it was an interesting wave where there were a few angel investors. There was maybe one seed fund. Y Combinator was just getting started. So it was a very interesting time where companies were just starting to come to life without needing a lot of money, and there weren't a lot of angel investors. So a perfect uh, kind of storm that basically created this angel investment movement. Um, and we basically wrote that, and then with every institutional fund, we tried to kind of, again, innovate and try different strategies of investing beyond Silicon Valley, investing across stages, kind of coming up with this philosophy that did not necessarily depend on catching the right valuation. And one of the things that I learned, a lot of our exits were very expensive deals that we were borderline uh, in terms of if we were going to come in or not. So that was one of the reasons why I stressed the fact that valuation does not matter as much because these companies can sometimes be really big that can warrant that higher valuation. And it's all about being in the right companies with the right founders. Let's talk about diversity a bit. You mentioned, you mentioned the word, and I think it's very central 
to what you do. If I look at your webpage, and um, at, that it's for investment professionals. For investment professionals. And the level of diversity you show is basically like a Banana Republic advert. It's absolutely amazing. There is an Asian American on there. There's an Indian guy on there. There's a Brazilian ex-investment banker, a Turkish ex-Google employee. You know, it's a, about as much diversity as you can cram into a four-person team as, uh, as you possibly could. How, how does that affect your conversation with companies? How does it affect your investment decision-making process? What does diversity really bring to the table? Yeah, I used to joke that uh, a Turkish man in VC is like a Jamaican bobsled team. Then I realized <laughs> with my team, it's more like you're taking you know, different people from each different Caribbean country and trying to go to Winter Olympics. Like, it's a crazy combination. <laughs> um, I think one well, of the- it's called Cool Runnings, right? Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that I was very motivated also from my Google experience is that diversity is not one of those things that, are, that is an add-on. I think it needs to be core at the DNA of the company that is pursuing it. And for me, the motivation for diversity was when I looked at you know, some of the VC firms that I was talking to before I started investing, the people look that they look like they had very similar backgrounds. And the thing that I was thinking is, look, the reason why diversity is important, this is an area where it's very, very tough to make decisions because you have incomplete information. These companies sometimes are crazy. We're talking about good crazy versus bad crazy. So you need a lot of different perspectives. So the way I thought about it is, the only way to improve decision-making quality is to bring as many people with different perspectives, different experiences, not just ancestral background, but also like where they grew up, you know, how, which career paths they had. Interestingly enough, it was a huge factor for us when we're approaching founders that we want to partner with because when they look at us, they see an underdog like themselves. They see people that are zagging when others are zigging. Um, we kind of look like them. We like to call ourselves like United Nations. Um, and a lot of our companies have kind of diverse backgrounds as well. So when we say that we're a different kind of VC and they see we are literally different in every way. Our office is different. Our team uh, layout is different. And I think they also how's your, get- how, How's your office different? Uh, our office looks like an architecture office. Doesn't look like a traditional VC office. We don't have like this crazy boardroom. Um, we often, you know, put people at ease. So it's a different approach. Okay. Now, unlike a lot of Silicon Valley VCs, you ventured to go outside Silicon Valley, and that doesn't mean you look at companies in Santa Barbara. It means you look at companies in Brazil, in Finland, in Germany, all over the place. What's hot? Which areas really excite you? Where do you see a lot of entrepreneurial talent springing up and sort of the good crazy ideas spring up? Yeah, so I think the biggest point on that, I think this is a pretty uh, global audience and you know, the, the theme here is uh, building bridges. You know, one of the things that I realized early is that you know, in venture a lot of times, the only way to invest beyond your own geography is to create a dedicated fund. So if you're a Silicon Valley firm, you want to invest uh, in a different country, you create a dedicated fund for that country. Um, I don't know, I have this philosophy that there is one universe of great companies and great founders, wherever they may be, and whenever we pick an area, we basically look globally where that company is. Sometimes it's in Silicon Valley, sometimes it's outside, sometimes I joke that even the uh, 13 US states that we invest, they can be like a different country. We have companies in Utah and Georgia, and sometimes it, it is really like investing in a different country. I think all we've done is literally find the company where it is and just visit them. We don't really care where they are. Um, I, we're seeing great activity in places like Canada and Australia, in Europe, in Northern Europe, Israel. I mean, there's a lot. I would say that the only two countries in the world that is probably a, a very sophisticated uh, ecosystem and probably warrants a dedicated fund is China and India, but I think anything else beyond, besides those and the US. Um, I think it's okay to have kind of a base, but these days with you know, video conferencing and being able to fly, it's not a big deal to invest outside of your home base. So you don't really have any areas where we would say, look, that right at the moment is red hot that I'd really like to look at? I mean, I think it was Brazil two years ago. A lot of people are talking about Indonesia now as um, sort of a really wide open space that can be invested in. You know, I think there is a lot of talent. So the way I think about it is not necessarily specific countries. I mean, their economies might be going through an interesting phase where the country as a whole is doing good. And so there is a tendency then to say, well, if the country is doing that well, then startups are going to do really well too. The way we think about it is different. Are there structural advantages? For instance, just to give you an example, we have now up to seven companies in Canada. There is great talent there. 
And the government made it very, very easy to not only to start companies, but there is huge incentives for technical talent where after everything is said and done, the labor cost, including the engineers for a company in Canada, could be as much as one-fifth uh, in Silicon Valley. And the rent is a lot cheaper. So when you take that into consideration, the biggest cost for a startup is labor and rent. So if you have a one to five advantage, everything else being equal, that makes things a lot easier. And that's the reason why probably there are companies that you can find that are international that are very scrappy. So they, came up with the, they come up with this DNA that actually is really good for them to become a very healthy, efficient company. So uh, I think that's one of the reasons why we like international investing, because while it's harder to find companies that are um, going to really shine and you know will be truly global leaders, on the other hand, because they go to, to, to against so much adversity, we find that it makes for a stronger kind of uh, founding team uh, and company when they get to scale, they really shine. We are almost running out of time. We have one minute left. So the three areas that you think are going to be really hot over the next 18 months that it's really worth watching and investing in. Yeah, so there are three. I can just quickly go. Um, I really think that consumerization of enterprise is one that we've been tracking. So this is the idea that everybody has a mobile phone. Uh, on the consumer side, I think there's been a lot of innovation. It's really tracking now uh, on the enterprise side as well. And we're kind of thinking and looking at industries that did not previously have a lot of technology penetration like transportation, logistics, or even areas like construction now is completely being reinvented, uh, reimagined with mobile solutions that are on the cloud. Um, the second area that I'm kind of fascinated with, and I think there was a great talk uh, on artificial intelligence and deep learning, I probably spent the last 20 years dealing with different AI and deep learning teams. I think this is going to be an area where you're going to have a few platform companies outside of the big four, like Amazon, Google, and Facebook. But also, it's going to be integrated into a lot more products. So I'm very, very bullish on uh, the impact of that. And then the last one, um, I think the origins of Silicon Valley came from this kind of uh, chip industry that all of a sudden spawned the hardware industry, which then spawned the software industry. I see some, kind of something similar happening with genomics and the cost of gene sequencing. It went from $10 million to sequence a genome to 1000 now going down to $99. That's an incredible difference, uh, seven orders of magnitude. And right now, it's mostly concentrated around diagnostics. But I am very bullish that there's going to be a whole new businesses created on it. Just to give you, like, leave you with one inspiring example, uh, we're involved in a company that's using next-gen sequencing to find out the real ingredients in every food item in the world, which is something that I, as a parent, really care about. So we are very bullish on and, and excited about the potential of uh, the future of gene sequencing as well. I didn't. I knew 20 minutes we would hardly have the time to scratch the surface. It's been great talking to you. Thank you so much for coming, and hope to see you at DLD again. Thanks, Martin. Appreciate it.